Difficult decisions, we all have to make them, but oftentimes we don't think through them enough. In this video, I'm going to cover the process I followed to decide to drop out. Now the entire video of me going through this process and making that decision is also on YouTube, but it's over six hours long. So this is a perfect little summary if you don't want to go through that entire video. Now, although this process is most applicable to career transitions and decisions, it can also be generalized to other types of decisions, like buying a home, making an investment decision, etc. So let's look over the process. When I made this decision, first I wanted, this is in particular just for YouTube. It's not necessarily something you should go through when making the decision, but all that might help. So before, right at the start of the video, I wanted to go over background information. This is just to give people a clear picture and be transparent about sort of where, what my background is and where I am and what position I am to make this decision. And because such a video of deciding to drop out can have, can impact people in lots of different ways. And so it's always best to just preface it and give some, be transparent. So now this is where the actual process starts of making a decision. And first is exploring all the possible outcomes or possible decisions that you want to make and envisioning sort of what success looks like. What is, what is something that, um, what's the best possible outcome that can happen? And so for me, the first sort of manner of doing that was calculating for each possible path that I want to take, what does the financial compensation look like when making a career decision such as whether I should do a PhD or wanting to do something else it's very difficult to say that my it's difficult to quantify how or predict how uh, all the other areas of your life are going to look like and basically the only solid piece of information that you can obtain is how much are you going to be compensated and how much are you going to have in your network net worth uh, by x amount of, of time and so for my phd i basically split this up into four paths first if i continue my current phd as is and then i spin off my healthcare project what is the highest possible success that we can obtain assuming that i exit out of that uh, startup or the company in 10 years. And so to do that, I basically looked at similar companies in healthcare. And so in this particular instance, my project is a wound assessment project. So I looked at three similar projects as well as, uh, other companies from my university that have been, that have been successful. And so this gives me sort of an upper bound, an average upper bound of what I can expect for 10 years. And so as a summary, I calculated that I would expect uh, if I were to work on this, if I were to work on my PhD for three to four more years and then exit out and work on, or and then graduate and then work on this company for eight to 10 more years, um, I would expect around 1.2 to 4.8 million if I sold this company in 10 to 14 years. Now, this is the current path I'm on. The next path is if I do a PhD and I, I would end up having to change the project I'm working on, working on, but let's say I do my PhD and then I go into corporate, work at a place like OpenAI. So three years for my PhD, maybe four, work at OpenAI, somewhere. This is again, best possible outcome. I get accepted into AI, OpenAI, where the salary is around a million dollars. That means in 10 years, I would expect the sal uh, net worth of around $4.2 million. Now that's with a PhD. The other option is no PhD. I can either pursue a corporate job or entrepreneurship. And so we'll, we'll define entrepreneurship, but corporate 
is essentially working at like Amazon or some other tech company. Given my background, electrical engineering, computer science, this is tech, corporate tech company. So working at a tech company for eight years, around $2 million on average. Uh, this isn't like expecting high, like a very good job. This is just an average sort of job around 200K a year. A little more maybe actually. And the other option is entrepreneurship. And so this is very broad. It can, <laughs> it can literally be, I'm working at McDonald's while I'm trying to work on an idea, which isn't what I want to do. Um, but it's something I do need to define. However, I'm not defining it here because it's uh, that would make this just too much of a rabbit hole. And we want to just be clear and make our decisions. And so for this, it's unbounded, but it's also unknown. I could have a, mil a billion dollar startup, but I could not. And it, I just completely flail and uh, doesn't go anywhere. So unbounded, but it's unknown. So that's the best possible outcomes and in the way that we can quantify it. So we're going by financial decision or financial compensation. So now that we've calculated the financial aspect, there's other aspects we need to consider when making a, a decision like this. And in this particular case, these are the criterion that I wanted to judge each path by. And these are criterion that I care about. And there's lots of other ones that I decided to ignore that I really didn't care about. So let's look at these criteria. My first one was whatever I do, it needs to have some sort of entrepreneurial opportunity. I have been putting it off for way too long. I care about that now. Secondly, I care about financial compensation. I want to be able to pay for my living expenses. Um, yeah, I want to be able to pay for my living expenses. I don't want to be broke anymore. So I care about financial compensation. I also care about innovation. I don't just want to be a hustler selling tennis shoes, tennis shoes, uh, sneakers or whatever you want to call them. But it, I need whatever I'm doing. It needs to provide some, it needs to be innovative and provide some sort of benefit to people. I want it to have networking potential. I don't want to just sort of stay in the same spot. I want to be able to keep moving up in what I'm developing and be able to reach more people. So for that, I need a network. I need a team. I want to have some autonomy. I don't necessarily want, I, I have enough initiative that I can decide sort of the pace that I attack or pursue efforts. And I want to be able to do that sort of with my strategy and at the pace I want to set stress levels and here I want to be clear stress levels for me means actual stress not you stress which is positive stress stress levels in the sense of it's a, it's impacting my ability to be productive and efficient so stress levels flexibility I like to be able to work again at my pace which is actually can be pretty fast uh, but I for that I need to sort of meet uh, I need to be able to work when I want and it, to say that I'm limiting myself to just nine to five it it doesn't for me isn't very productive also commuting time if I'm with whatever I do I find myself commuting 30 45 minutes one way that's already taking two hours out of my day and that really again kills the number of productive hours i have in a day work-life balance this is more in the sense of i it's a little bit in the sense of flexibility in this that i want to be able to exercise in the morning so maybe i start my day a little bit later and i want to be able to uh, decide my hours which um, means that on Tuesdays, for example, let's say I always want to be able to spend some time with my wife. Now, this means that I don't want to be available for on calls at this time on this day. 
And so being able to set sort of those boundaries for myself, I want to have that decision. So that's, for me, what work-life balance means. But it, I am open to working eight, nine, ten hours a day when, when I need to, which is most days. Now, job security. This I included just to, um, to try to be a little bit fair, I guess, towards corporate and PhD, but it's something that I don't very, I don't care about a lot. If I have money and no job, that's fine. If I, yeah, if I have money and no job, that's fine. And then career advancement, again, this is something I don't care about. I, I don't care about building a reputation within a company. Uh, and if I end up just being rich as a business owner, um, but don't really have like a, I don't know, that's not maybe the best example, but I, for me, the, I, I guess like the LinkedIn, uh, if you've seen people's LinkedIn where they say like, uh, Harvard graduate, and then they say next thing is like, assistant lawyer associate lawyer and then next step is senior partner and then next step is for firm owner like i that's what i envision when i see career advancement that's not something that i care about and so for each of these criterion i decided how important it is to me so entrepreneurial opportunity 10 i care about it a lot financial compensation 10 i care about it a lot innovation 10, I care about this a lot. All the way down to career advancement, job security. Don't really care about these. Now, for, for each of the rows in the matrix, so these are the, the, the items in the matrix, you want to decide, or for each of the columns, yeah, you want to list out the path. So no PhD, corporate, doing my PhD and then going into corporate, or doing my PhD and spinning off my research. For each of these criterion, I'm gonna, for each of these criteria, I'm gonna list on a scale of one to 10, how, uh, how much this criteria, the, this particular criteria, criterion, how much this is present in that pathway. So if I do new, no PhD, it's because I'm going to be exploring, I'm going to be forging my own path. I'm going to be exploring and uh, taking an entrepreneurial uh, journey. And so 10, on entrepreneurial opportunity is 10. It's, that's the whole purpose. For financial compensation, this one was a little bit tricky because, let's see. Let me pull. So we're looking at the next 10 years. How much am I going to have in profit at 10 years if I don't spend anything? So what it's supposed to be is with 70% certainty, I'm going to have this amount. So this was assuming 80K each year. So it would be actually 800,000 times 70% or 0 0.7. And then with 20% that at the end, I'm going to have $2 million. Then with... This is with 9% chance at the end of 10 years, I'm going to have $10 million. And then let's put in the chance of having a billion. So for the billion, I just calculated how many billionaires there are in America divided by the number of people in America. So it's actually a very, very small percentage, which is there. And so that calculates about a million point three, $1.3 million dollars. I'll have in 10 years, which is actually fudged. It would actually be more like close to 2 million. And then for corporate, this was just following. So for corporate, 10 years, about $3 million. Because we're in tech, we get paid on the lower end, two million, and over the next 10 years, that's enough to go up several tiers. So around $3 million. PhD plus corporate, this 
is assuming I get just a PhD salary for the next three years. And after that, I'm making about a million dollars a year. And this is the best possible outcome. And then PhD plus wound, we calculated this. It's about 1.2 to 4.2 million dollars. So on average, we're just going to do three million dollars. So this is what we can expect. Now, we're going to normalize this. And so by normalizing, I I use ChatGPT just to, I asked it to normalize it following a normal distribution, I believe. Um, which I mean, there, there could have been better ways to normalize it, but I, the decision ended up going my way because we can see no PhD was still ranked really low on a scale one to 10. This is a 3.5. Well, all of the other decisions had a lot better financial uh, opportunities. And even, even though this was the case in my particular situation, this was strong enough to still come out as the best outcome. So if, in your case, if you see that um, that trying different normalization strategies for this can result in different outcomes, then think about which one is probably the best to use. And yeah, you can just feed in these numbers to ChatGPT, ask it to normalize it. Um, yeah, so this is what I got for that. Now. For the rest of the other ones, this is just following what the process I described for entrepreneurial opportunity. For innovation, I know uh, no PhD. I'm going to be limited by money a little bit, uh, at least at the start. And if assuming some success eventually, I am going to be focused on innovation. So we're going to rank it at seven. Corporate, not so much innovation because I'll be focused on what they want me to do. Um, but there is a chance that I get to work at the edge, depending on the company's culture and, and the problems that I'm solving in there. If I do, a, if I do a PhD plus corporate, it, I'll be an expert at whatever I'm doing. So whatever company has hired me, it's likely because I'm going to be working again as an expert in that field. So I'm probably going to be working on an innovative project there. PhD plus wound. This is focusing on my current project. I wouldn't say it's as much innovative as it is impactful. It's already using technologies that are available, probably uh, using machine. It's not necessarily inventing new machine learning algorithms. It is uh, adjusting some and maybe make having some innovation, but not as much as uh, these other areas. So. I put it slightly below corporate and no PhD. Now networking potential, again, the same autonomy, stress levels, uh, flexibility, commuting time, so on. And so once you have these numbers, then you want to multiply each entry in under a pathway by the criterion weight. So for no PhD, 10 times 10 is 100. So here we see 100. Then we have 3.52 times 10, 35.2. 7 times 10, 70. And so on. So just go down column and multiply them out. And then you have these numbers. Do the same for the other ones. And then you end up with this final row. Now this final row is essentially telling you quantitatively how each meet your criteria. So we can see the score tells you relative to each other, which is more likely to meet your criteria. And so no PhD had the highest score, followed very closely by PhD plus corporate, followed, followed quite a bit away from, or having the slight gap, there's corporate and then having an even larger gap is PhD plus one. So here we can see clear decision, not necessarily clear, but sort of the two pathways that I really need to consider are these two, no PhD and PhD plus corporate if I wanna be most happy with my decision. And so this is when we have that, but we need to be even more thorough. So let's go through this sort of 
outcome and analyze the advantages and disadvantages of each to look at the qualitative aspects because we already looked at the quantitative. We looked at what criteria we can put numbers to, but what about the things we can't put numbers to? So looking at the advantages and dis disadvantages for each pathway for PhD plus one, the advantages were degree. Degree is kind of hard to put a number to. We already looked at financial compensation, so there's that, but like, um, it's, it's hard to put a number to it, how much it's gonna impact our life, but on average we can use financial compensation, but we already looked at that, and we wanna look at the more qualitative aspects. So we're just gonna add degree. We also know that PhD plus one, there is some innovation, although it may not be necessarily cutting edge, it is impactful. Now the disadvantages for me of a PhD plus wound means would be one of them would be funding. So currently the pro the project is unfunded, and we're talking more from an academic standpoint. Uh, you need funding to pay for the pay for the tuition and to pay for living expenses as a PhD student, uh, and to get other students to work on the project with you. You need and, and so because of that. I'm also worried about finances, so I have to work as a TA, which means around 15 hours a week, typically maybe a little bit less, um, but that's another part. And then in addition to that, we're talking about a time commitment. So this means that we have to work on the PhD, or I have to work on the PhD for the next three years. And then <clears throat> after that, it's, 10 years trying to get the company up and running on average from the the other companies we looked at and so if it fails i have to start over and that means or what start starting over means in my case it's that i may not necessarily use the knowledge i use i i obtained as a phd for my next startup and so starting over would be now i have to learn the necessary skills to make the next startup. And so that's starting over. And that actually ties in with risk of specialization. So have being an expert in a specific area, but not having it translate into anything. And then also bad logistics. Um, so given that I'm going to be focused on TAing, not necessarily focused, but I have to divide my focus between TAing, applying for funding, managing five people, and if it fails, in 10 years, I'm gonna be in my mid 30s, and so I'm gonna be less likely to take risks if I don't have any sort of money to rely on. And um, I'm married, I have to, I may have kids at that point, so I'm not gonna be able to support my family and that's not something I want to do I want to take my risks right now and then some points that were null that do come up but I don't think they influence the decision I'm going to be an expert but it may not be in an area that will be helpful for my next startups also network if I don't think I want to continue in healthcare because lots of barriers and I don't have sort of resources or capital to recruit a team and keep it going long enough. And if I did continue with this project, I'd have a network in healthcare, but that's not something that I would be able to use in the future if this project fails. Looking at corporate, steady income, there's resources, networking, professional development, disadvantages, less autonomy, there's bureaucracy, and limited entrepreneurial opportunity. That's corporate, PhD plus corporate. So here, because I am an expert in my field, probably gonna be recruited to work on something innovative. I'm gonna have a steady income. Income is gonna be a lot higher. I'll have resources. I'll be able to network, especially because I'm an expert. So a networking will be a lot more easier, I guess. Professional development and then credibility of the PhD. The disadvantages is that as a PhD student, regardless of whether I continue in this project or in another project, I'm always gonna have to try to find funding. So whether that means 
applying for grants for the project or applying for fellowships. It's something I'm going to have to actively spend time doing and doing it well because they're competitive. And because I have to find funding, in the meantime, I'll also have to worry about how I'm going to finance my PhD. And so that means TAing, working again, 50, a minimum of 15 hours a week. And yeah, and in addition to that, as a PhD student, and then going into corporate, that means whatever entrepreneurial uh, opportunities I want to pursue, I won't be able to until around 11 years from now, because three years from my PhD, focusing on becoming an expert, and then eight years learning the ropes in industry and really becoming an industry voice. And then at that point, I can sort of have a pick of the top talent and try to recruit them for whatever startup I want to branch off into. But it's a very long time horizon. Now the other option, no PhD. The advantages are I get to immediately start an entrepreneurship I have full autonomy. I get to decide what I'm doing, which may not always be the good, uh, the best thing, but full autonomy. Agility, I can pivot quickly and take advantages of whatever opportunities I see the same day, basically. Potential for high reward. Uh, something that I've been noticing is there's lots of startups, especially now, that you don't really need a lot to get going. I've seen YC uh, startups that just have an app, an app that you can probably make in less than a month. And yeah, they, in less than a month, you can get probably like two months. You can, two months of it on the worst case, two months you can make an app, make a video, get some initial customers, and make an application to YC and you already funded half a million dollars. Disadvantages is that there's lots of risk. There's lots of people trying to do this. It's always uncertain what's gonna happen. Competition might see what you're doing, try to copy you. Income variability as a result, there's no guarantees at all. And resource constraint, um, because I'm gonna be trying to make because I'm trying to make my own money and because income is variable, you're always, it's always a question of what to spend when and when should you invest in more resources or not. So that's looking at the advantages and disadvantages of, of the decisions from the weighted matrix, weighted matrix. And so now, that we have the outcomes from the weighted matrix and we know the disadvantages and advantages of each of the pathways. Now it's just a question of putting it all together and analyzing it. So to put it all together, I've made this sort of summary, like four or five paragraph report on something I can for so it can be something I can refer to in the future. And it it's also very helpful if I do end up going into corporate or somewhere else where people are going to be asking, why did I drop out? What is What was the decision behind that? This is going to be something that shows that I actually put thought into making my decision um, because there are going to be questions. As a PhD dropout, people are immediately going to wonder, was it too difficult? Couldn't handle the stress? Um, are you a quitter? So it, it, it's all valid questions. If you're going to be working um, in a startup, you want to know sort of your team's faults and, and know their flaws and where things can go wrong. And so this is a very valid concern, I guess, that I've prepared to address. And this is sort of my way of doing it for myself, but also preparing for future questions. And so for me, it this all started... Start, <laughs> This all started off because I realized I'm at a point in my journey where I really need to clear up my goals and make sure that I'm pursuing a path that aligns with these goals. Because too often, at the end of the day, especially when I'm sort of working on sprints for my PhD, I'm often wondering 
is this something that I actually want to do long term it, because it doesn't quite feel like it's aligning with my internal compass and so that's what started this off the first thing we did for to analyze that decision was let's look at the tenure compensation so we can see phd had the least no phd had the least amount of compensation corporate had a little bit more phd plus corporate a little bit more phd plus one is comparable to corporate and and then the one limitation of this uh summary is that it's only limited to 10 years what the next 30 years look like is completely unknown we don't know if for example phd plus corporate would have been the right decision maybe having a phd and then going into corporate learning the ropes i become part of the i don't know open ai mafia so that's a reference to paypal mafia where tess or elon and lots of other people worked on paypal and then they all branched off and they all sort of became very successful in their own rights so maybe that could have been something that happened or maybe phd plus wound let's say i learned the ropes handled all the stress went into wound try to spin off maybe it worked maybe it didn't work found another healthcare company and because i learned the ropes and was managed to manage to handle manage how do you say manage to walk in sort of the difficult area that is healthcare i found another healthcare problem that was worth billions that could very much be a valid point for this or corporate let's say maybe i'm the next steve bomber well i don't know if that's a thing people are, would say to be proud of but uh, some people might be so i don't know <laughs> and then no phd let's say i don't know i make the next yc company that is a unicorn billion dollars so each of these in their own right in 30 years is can be something completely unexpected or they can easily have been a fail. We can't know, but that's what we're looking at. And we're trying to just make a decision that aligns with our compass at the moment. And so to add more depth to this decision, we're looking at aspects that we that are qualitative that we can uh, decide on. And so we did the weighted decision matrix, and this is what came of it. The highest two decisions were no PhD and PhD plus corporate. And, and so analyzing why this one was first in the lowest position, it's because it requires a considerable time commitment it's looking at a 10 to 14 year horizon. So I'm in my mid thirties. There's lots of financial uncertainties and there's high stress, which is actually having an, an impact on my health. Like it's very quantifiable how the stress is impacting my health. And I'll just say it's blood pressure. So, um, yeah, so this is the first thing that we're going to rule out because of these factors and, uh, the the score considering yeah these factors basically summarize it then the next thing is that now we're going to basically analyze these two because we can make the observation that no phd is not necessarily just a one-way door like i take the pathway to one to no phd and it crosses it per prevents me from doing any other outcome. And that's not true because I can always go into corporate because tech is so, because there's so many different areas in tech and because as an, in my no PhD, I'm gonna be learning mobile app development, web development and machine learning. I can always go into corporate as a safety net, let's say in two years if no PhD, nothing, I haven't been able to make anything of myself, nothing is happening, make the decision to go into corporate and at least that way we can afford a home and I can pay for, for the things we need and I can start getting us a retirement plan, I don't know. 
So that's one observation. The second observation is that PhD plus corporate, this one seems like a, like a cool option because it means I'm an industry expert and I'm learning the ropes. So it's very, it's structured and it has clear stages. But the one huge downside is it has a lot of a significant delay to entrepreneurship. I'm basically gonna be spending 10 to 14 years or around 11 years studying and then learning the ropes. And so entrepreneurship doesn't really come in until I decide to branch off and at that point, I'm going to have to be learning on the spot and it can make it. Well, the bigger factor is that I'm going to be delaying entrepreneur opportunity. So given those observations, I wanted to add in a little bit of a personal perspective to my decision. So since I was a kid, I've always been interested in entrepreneurship and innovation. They really go hand in hand because you can have innovation, but without being able to market it and, and find a way to make it sustainable, make it something that you can continue to produce. If it's a product or service, um, then it's not gonna stay around for long. So entrepreneurship hand in hand with innovation. And I've been inspired by figures like Tony Stark, Thomas Edison, Elon Musk. And these people are, I think are good examples of uh, in innovation and entrepreneurship and so uh let's see dream of forging my own path navigate the complexities and so adding that to the fact that now that i'm doing my phd it i feel stress in a way that it's not productive it's not fueling me and it's not driving me forward and at the end of the day, I just feel restless because I didn't quite work on what I wanted to. And so, yeah, so the stress of academic pursuits, I'm deciding to leave my PhD. That's the summary of, or the final decision of this process. Time for me to embrace my entrepreneurial journey because it resonates with my ambitions that I've had as a kid and it aligns with my dreams and yeah I think that's an overview of the summary or of the process that I went through and I think one thing I want to add is any one decision is valid as long as it's sustainable and aligns with your goals and ambition because when I mentioned earlier when when I said that what was it oh yeah here that this is limited to 10 years in 30 years who knows what could have happened I could have been a late entrepreneur follow followed this pathway really learned the ins and out of healthcare entrepreneurship and I don't know, started something that I was in a unique position to, and it ended up being a billion dollar company. That's very valid. And some people may have, may be in a better position to pursue this. Maybe they didn't have to take loans like I did. And maybe they, they're not worried about kids. They're not worried about, um, they're whatever position they're in. The, they're in a much better position to take on this and it's more of their calling they care about health care this much that that they can um they can go through it it's their it's their calling very valid other people they want to be an industry voice they want to be uh, working on innovative stuff and they care more about research Maybe entrepreneurship is in their, on the horizon, but it's not something that immediately calls, doesn't immediately call to them. <laughs> it's something that they want to do right now. Uh, very valid. So lots of different pathways 
each has its own trade-off but we're looking for the pathway that is meets my criteria and is something that I can that I feel field and uh, passion to go through because no PhD or despite that no PhD has so much risk the passion I have for it is completely willing to handle the, the income variability, the risk of it, the chance that I may fail five, six times, but I know somehow I'm going to find a way to make it through. That's, that's something I can put up with. And that's my path. The, that may not be for everyone and their path may not, is not for me. So that's sort of my summary. So just going over this from an overview, uh, there's there's something we're considering. Considering multiple paths, what are the different pathways? Let's be clear on them and specify the best possible outcome for each. Not necessarily the outliers, but the average best possible outcome. And so in this case, for career decisions, it's typically financial compensation. That's the easiest to review or to get figures for. Now, in addition to financial compensation, we want to consider other criteria. So for career transition or education, deciding between education and career, there are criteria that you care about. So these you can list, assign a weight to them. Now for each pathway, specify how um, how much of that criteria weighs is is a part of that pathway and so once you have that you can multiply these two the criteria weight by the the rating on from one to ten of how much that criteria impacts it and then you have these numbers so then you can just sum these up and you have scores for how likely or how much each pathway align scores okay so let's see you have scores for each pathway and the, these are relative to each other and the one the pathway with the highest score is probably the best outcome but there are other things we have to consider that are qualitative qualitative that are not um, considered in this weighted decision matrix and then also relative to each other you can see these are just five apart and then corporate is a little bit behind, but then this is a worse decision. So with this, you can already start to make a decision like this. We can start to see why it's may not be the best decision. And from these numbers here, we can see for each of these, it ranks slightly lower than corporate even, which is like a baseline. So we would prefer corporate before this, but anyways, once we have those, the weighted decision outcomes, then for each, come up with advantages, disadvantages. And this should try not, try not to be as much of an overlap with the weighted decision matrix. So you want to look for aspects that are more qualitative that you can't necessarily consider. For example, bad logistics. How can I consider that I, by the time I'm 30, I want to be somewhat stable enough that I can pursue entrepreneurship for a full time. And once you have those advantages and disadvantages, let's summarize everything. Let's go through tenure compensation, go through the different scores, and then use the advantages and disadvantages to start to rule them out. And so that's what I did here, made my final decision adding a little bit of a, a perspective to, to make my decision on what I think I can, what I think can feel me the longest and that I am most comfortable in. Yeah, hopefully this, this works out for you. And if you found this helpful, please subscribe. It helps, <laughs> it helps me on this new path of entrepreneurship where I'm not sure where it's going to take me. In fact, my next video is probably going to be 
six hours working probably even longer than six hours making a plan of how i'm going to get to 5k in passive income to try to support myself so i can uh i can have some longevity in entrepreneurship and and, and that i'm able to fail and so i might pursue i don't know pat uh apps or services that can give me that 5k in passive income maybe they're not as innovative but they address a pain point and uh and give me that 5k passive income so yeah please subscribe it helps if you found this helpful any other thoughts or comments please let me know in the in the comment section